And there we go. Hey everybody, welcome to the Frankie Slauson Show, and welcome to now as we start the month of August, the second half of the Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture interview series, and we, we try to get as many uh, big names as we can, uh, but even if they're not alive anymore, uh, we try to find, I try to try find people throughout the internet uh, who are doing, uh, either doing like a tribute or doing like some type of a way to uh, keep the old music alive as we say. Uh, today I'm interviewing. <laughs> no problem. Uh, yeah, that's good. That that's that's what we that's what what our band does. We we work on keeping the music alive from them. That's that pretty much uh, hits it on the target. I, I saw you were doing a you're doing an interview with uh, uh, Trini Lopez coming yep. up, or did you do that already? I'm actually doing that on Friday, actually. Uh, that's exciting. <laughs> yeah, it is. That, that's exciting. That's very neat. And, and uh, the guy who is speaking right now is uh, Mike Randall, and he's from Arizona. Uh, but he uh, he does a, a Buddy Holly tribute, and and uh, plays with his band called, uh, I believe, Comeback Buddy. I believe, is that right? Yes. And actually, I would like to clarify that because a lot of people take what we do; they may take it at face value and say that we're a tribute band. And some promoters do that too. If you notice from our website, we don't call ourselves a tribute band because we really do all kinds of music from that uh, time period. Uh-huh. We, we cover the music of a lot of different artists. Uh, I mean, you can check out our, our list of songs that we do. Oh, sure. But um, we kind of, uh, we, we do what we do in honor of Buddy Holly. We do it, uh, we kind of have a Buddy Holly attitude about the way we do things. We, um, But we cover um, a lot of that style music from that time, of course, Elvis and um, Chuck Berry, Roy Orbison, I can name a lot of different artists. We do Johnny Cash and um, uh, Johnny Horton and oh, a, lot of, a lot of different um, music from different areas of the, the country yeah, that were going on at that time. So we cover a, lo- a lot of that music and we play dances for people who I think, I think, um, we get it. We we get the opportunity to play for the people who called that their music. So at the time they were teenagers, they're now dancing to this music again when we play it for them. So oh, we get the opportunity to do that, and we really um, enjoy it, and they enjoy it a lot too. So we we keep very busy doing it, and uh, we're happy that we are. So well, that's cool. It's kind of like stepping back in time, more or less. You know, even though uh, you know you were born in the sixties. I was born in the 80s, and, and I think it's just kind of neat to know that there's people that actually do stuff like this, you know, even in Arizona, of all places. I, I think Arizona is probably a good spot for that because of the Texas connection with Buddy Holly and everything. I think so, and another part of it, too, that we've discovered, my wife is in the group with me, her name's Janine, and her nickname's Peggy Sue, but she is a, she's a big part of what we do here, and she handles a lot of our website work, and and uh, anyway, um, we have found that Arizona has a lot of people coming here for the winter because the weather's great here, so they call them snowbirds. There's a lot of them oh, that sure. come here. A lot of them from Canada. We get to meet a lot of nice people from Canada who come in, uh, to the events we play at or we go to the, where they are. There's a lot of resorts out here that they're out for the winter months or, um, uh, I guess, home areas they're not they're not all resorts some of them are just uh, um, places where they their homes are oh, sure. you know and they have dances and sock hops they call them they'll have a lot of sock hops so we do those through up and have a lot of fun doing them so oh that's cool yeah a lot, I, a lot of music a lot of music for them to dance oh so. yeah I have a, I have a have oh go, go ahead. ahead go ahead Sorry. I have a great aunt we, that lives there in Arizona in Dolan Springs I'm sorry, you have a what? I didn't hear that. Oh, I said I have a, a great aunt that lives in Dolan Springs, Arizona. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, I think you should come and visit sometime. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think Arizona is, uh, is like I said, you know, a perfect place because of that uh, that Texas connection or, or just the fact that it's, it's down south and, uh, and a lot of people yeah, don't definitely. remember. Yeah, so I think that's cool. <laughs> Yeah, the winter winter's the best time to come. I'm from Illinois, so I'm a little familiar with the winter there. It's a little more severe, but <laughs> yeah. not a little bit more. So, 
Yeah, well, we we get some cold winters here in northern Minnesota, but uh, soon I'll be uh, I'll be leaving to uh, move to South Dakota here. Uh, actually, this weekend, actually, I'm moving to uh, wow. the Black Hills of South Dakota. This is my last week living in northern Minnesota. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so it's kind of I'm just trying to get all this stuff done before uh, I move by. But by the time this airs, I've already or, already been in South Dakota already. So <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, good. Yeah, but Northern Minnesota was my home area. I mean, it's pretty much where I grew up. And so yeah, we've had lots of different type of winters. Some good, some bad, some really bad. Uh, some I was surprised that even uh, winter actually. Uh, when it was like warmer, the temperatures were a little bit more warmer. So on Christmas time, normally we'd have lots of snow. We didn't have any snow on Christmas, so that, I thought it was kind of kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, you never know what's going to hit you. I mean, you're you're especially living in that part of the country. You're definitely always ready for spring to get here, and then right when it, you think it's going to be here, it, it dumps on you again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And you know we're uh, I'm only uh, technically only three hours away from where uh, Buddy Holly and the Big Bopper and Richard Valens were supposed to uh, do their next tour date uh, uh, in uh, Morehead. So I'm only like two oh, or three okay. hours away. So it's kind of kind of kind of neat to, the, to transition for that. Oh, definitely, definitely. I, I um, actually had the uh, opportunity to meet the Big Bopper's son this year. Okay. Um, J.P. Richardson. Um, his son is doing a, a, a show uh, uh, honoring his dad. He actually plays him in a show, so yep. it's pretty neat. I actually had the opportunity. I don't know how far back you've looked at some of my interviews, but if you go by, way back to uh, last Christmas in 2012, I actually got okay. to I actually got to do a full length interview with uh, J.P. Richardson. Well, that's neat. I like him. He's a nice guy. <laughs> yeah. I think it's cool that he keeps his dad's memory alive. That's really that's oh, really cool. Yeah, yeah. He took the time and talked to us, and I just thought he was a neat guy. He, he was just, uh, and I, I have a, uh, I, 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 on our website we have we mentioned it on there under our news and reviews page. But I, I consider him rock and roll royalty. Yeah, because <laughs> he's just like one. His dad was one of the pioneers, and and uh, it just. <laughs> to me, that just, it means a lot to me to meet him. So I thought it was really, really neat that he's doing his uh, an honor to his dad's work. So it's kind of neat too to know that that a lot of uh, the legendary rock and roll artists are from around uh, Texas and Arizona and Florida and California, around where you're located. I think so. Yeah, I'm um, Marty Robbins. Well, he wasn't rock and roll, but he was from Glendale, which is right, right, not too far from where I live and we, we do a Marty Robbins song because when we first started playing everyone asked us to do one so we we do the song of White Sport Coat and right. people always get up and dance to that one so we play that one all the time so when you when you guys play do you guys focus more on the hits or do you ever like uh, play some uh, mystery tracks um actually our our music uh, we we our main focus we we want people to dance when we play. Yeah. So we'll do we'll do some medleys, and and for the medley we might throw in something that they don't hear as often, and then we'll go into one that's more popular, and it's just kind of kind of a nice uh, lead into it. So whatever we do, we try and do it to keep the people up on the dance floor. So we have some medleys that are kind of they're kind of like a marathons where the people just keep staying up there and going. So. <laughs> But we uh, we do throw some in there that are are not heard as often. So okay, well that's cool. And uh, so uh, a question to ask: uh, Where did your love for old music kind of start? For those who don't know, um, actually, um, my my mother was a, a singer. Her and her sister sang in a vocal group in in the, in the Chicago area. They were uh, similar to. Um, the, the vocal groups that came out of the 40s and okay. 50s and they, so they, they were uh, doing that in their teen years and their early 20s and they always and their brothers were musicians and they played uh, one played drums one played the, the saxophone and one played the trumpet and actually my brothers and I each became uh, those we studied those instruments in school, so we we were mu- 
playing music since we were in grade school. So we always liked it. My mom was always supportive of it. And then as teens, my brothers and I started a band in in the Midwest. We had a little rock band. Um, and so we did that as teens, too, and we started playing guitars then. And I, uh, I'll try and keep this short, because I know you have so much time to do this. Oh, awesome. um, we uh, we had a band, and we at the time we were doing the 70s rock, because uh, it was in the 70s, and sure. we did a little bit of music from the 60s. We did Beatles, and um, we did... Uh, um, things that were on the radio, Jackson Brown, the Eagles, a Bad Company, uh, it's Steppenwolf, all kinds of music like that. And anyway, our school teachers, our high school teachers, uh, put together a band for fun, and they were a, their music, they were known afterwards, 50s, because at the time that, that you know, they were, that was their music. So we sort of, uh, the way it worked out is they had a sock hop at her high school and I dressed up like a guy that I thought looked like he was from the 50s and I took some sunglasses and popped the lenses out of them and wore a button up shirt and combed my hair back and, <laughs> and anyway I was told by the leader of their group that I looked like Buddy Holly and I was 14 I think maybe 15 at the time and I didn't know who Buddy Holly was I oh, didn't wow. actually know who he was oh, okay. I was playing music and everything so, so it was so you know it was still so new that Buddy Holly was gone I think in, in my view that you know the, it's very possible that people wouldn't know so much about him and, and I don't even think the Buddy Holly story came out yet I'm not sure what year that came out but 70, I don't think it was even out for people to know or talk about yeah, 1978, you know, you talked about it in that interview with sure. Buddy's brother but so that would have that would have sort of woken people up to who he was but I think um, since that but it wasn't really out there I mean there was a TV show called Happy Days on in the 70s so people were getting fired up about the 50s again so it was kind of neat anyway we joined in with our teachers our band did and we for fun we started playing at um, some Elks clubs and and uh, people people got all excited about it it was it was a fun thing to do so that was an education for me I learned um, I learned how much people like that music and then years passed and I went other place in my life in music and it just so happened in, back in the 90s um, something where I was I got volunteered to do a Buddy Holly impersonation at someone's birthday party because they were born on the day the music died oh, wow. and it was the, the person's 50th birthday and my, my brother Dean volunteered me to do it and I, I um, accepted it and I started working on it, although I'd never sung a Buddy Holly song before at that time, but I did a lot of singing and I did a lot of other music, so I started working it up. So that, that's how it happened, and oh, people, wow. it started, it started uh, people, um, we, I started realizing how much people liked it, and I started playing that music again, and I went back to the old days of when we played with our high school teachers, and I, I pretty much... I uh, remembered all the songs we did and started working those up again. So that's how it started happening. And I met Janine uh, through doing that because she was in a dance troupe that worked with the production company that I was doing, the Buddy Holly um, act with. So that's how we started. And then we decided to start our own group. So Ooh. we did it that way. And that's where it all started. So oh, wow. um, I cool. think we kind of modeled it after the group we had in the 70s with our teachers because we knew how much people liked all of that music, so oh, yeah. that's kind of how, that's kind of how it, it happened. So. And that's just the thing, too. I mean, everybody, uh, even to this day, uh, you know, you, hear, still, you still hear it on the radio, but nowadays it's more, it's more, I don't know, it's, it's not so much the oldies as much, it's more music that uh, some people say is slowly fading away, and then it's kind of sad that, that some of this... Uh, what people would call old fogey music, which is just rock and roll oldies, uh, is technically kind of, kind of fading away for the new stuff that's that's been out for a while. Like like nowadays, I think they consider more or less the oldies, like anything from the seventies, eighties, and even almost nineties now. I think you're sort. right. Yeah, for a while, the programming <laughs> that m the major stations were doing, they dropped the fifties and they made the sixties oldies, and yeah. then it's got to a point where they dropped the sixties now. 
and now the 70s are oldies, so I think it just goes by generation that they do that. But um, I have found uh, by doing this music, I have met a lot of people who um, they they have so many stories about things that went on. I mean, it's so neat to meet people who, let's say, have met Elvis, or um, yeah. there's a group of people that are, go to... Uh, come out and see us out here they call themselves the 59ers they went to mason city high school in iowa and a lot of them saw buddy holly on his last show at the surf ballroom that night they saw him perform on his last show and then they went to school the next day and in the news about the plane crash and a lot of them a lot of them at the school left on their lunch break to go out to the crash site and they never came back to school that day it was just it was just a, a big deal. A big, of course, it was a big deal. Oh, yeah. But, um, we we get to hear a lot of stories. I learn things that I haven't found in any books anywhere about uh, artists and what they did. And um, one thing I thought was fascinating is one of the Fifty ers who was at the surf ballroom. He saw Buddy Holly for the first time that night, <laughs> and uh, he, while he was watching the other groups, because Buddy Holly played at the end, there was a uh, guy playing drums that he thought looked like Buddy Holly. Okay. And uh, when when Buddy Holly came out, he realized Buddy Holly was playing drums for the other bands that night. Oh, yeah. So he was playing drums, and then he got up and did his thing after that. So uh, he was a talented guy, but I never knew that. Nobody ever talked about it, but you can see it in some photos oh, sure. um, of that night. You can catch it and see that Buddy's playing drums back there. I guess their drummer had a... a I don't know, he froze his feet on the bus or something. What's the story I heard? I think Waylon said that or something. But yeah. um, um, anyway, that was about, to me, when I hear these things, and I, I uh, played an event in Dallas last fall, um, and the person who, who hired me told me that her dad saw Roy Orbison uh, in the Teen Kings was his band uh, when he was, just starting yep. um, they played at his senior prom in high school in Texas so oh, um, stories like that are pretty neat to hear from me I, I get to learn a lot I can tell you a lot of stories that we probably don't have enough time to talk about here but I I, uh, I get to look from them so um, yeah right. yeah I mean that, no that's, 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 that's cool because uh, uh, you're right uh, I, I saw some old photos too uh, of the of the last night that are finally uh, finally getting released. Uh, pe- actually, I think more or less the fact that uh, uh, where I found them from, I think uh, J.P. Richardson's like son-in-law has uh, uh, of, of photos that uh, J.P. must uh, must have had in a collection or something that are finally getting released, and, and it is cool to see all that stuff because you kind of wonder. Uh, because you know, back in those days, you know that stuff wasn't televised or anything like that. I mean, as far as like a, a concert like that. And, and right. if it would have been, oh boy. <laughs> Imagine oh, how much bigger that would have been. <laughs> well, it was amazing. I thought, too, is at the surf ballroom, too. Well, when people went and see these shows, they, they danced, too. It was some of the places you were dancing, you weren't sitting in a chair watching a concert. So yeah. they were set up more to do both. You can watch them or you can you can dance there. So uh, one of a friend of ours, he used to, he's from Texas, and he used to take uh, dates when he was in high school to Elvis when when he came into town. And he said his best experience he said with dates were when he took him to see Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot, a lot of people were fans of Elvis, so uh, the girls liked him a lot. And so... Yeah, yeah we, we play Elvis music. Some nights we do more Elvis than anything else, and I'm a big Elvis fan too. So I, well, I I, I, I like Elvis too, but to me, you know, it's like, like I told you yesterday. I mean, I'm, I'm only 29, so I, I grew up kind of on Buddy Holly music. Dad, he got got me into so yeah. watch Buddy Holly story so many times, watch La Bamba so many times. Uh, Elvis was okay in my book, but I I truly believe the real pioneer of rock and roll was Buddy Holly. I really believe hey. that. You know, and I'm not just saying that's because of the interview. I'm saying that because I've always believed that he is the guy yeah. that got rock and roll fun and interesting. It wasn't just Elvis. <laughs> yeah, I I met another guy that helped me out with certain things. Have you ever um, heard of Jerry Naylor? I'm not too sure. I don't think I have. 
Um, Jerry Naylor actually uh, sang with the Crickets after Buddy was gone. Oh, okay. Okay. And, and, and he's with them for about five years, and he wrote a book called Rockabilly Legends. Legends of uh, Rockabilly Legends. Actually, there's a page on our website dedicated yeah. to that book. Yeah. And uh, he's a he's a, a great a uh, great guy, and uh, he he answered a lot of questions I had um, about. Uh, some things that happened back then, some more current things regarding the, you know. Yeah. Just, anyway, he's a great guy. You can find out about him on Facebook too. His name is Jerry Naylor. So what but, did uh, uh, I what, met him? My, what my did daughter uh, was going to okay. school up in in, uh, in Oregon, and he, he okay. came and did a, a little show at the school, and he was talking about his book and shot me the book, and I went up to see her at school and. We contacted him and we met with him for a little while. Uh -huh. And so uh, I, I think you might want to check him out and see. Yeah. He's actually done uh, some documentaries as well. So he might be someone you might want to. I talk might have to. to well, so. I might have to do that. I might have to look him up. I was always kind of wondering when uh, when so Sonny Curtis took over for uh, the Crickets because it wasn't the lead singer for the Crickets for a while. Sonny yeah, Curtis? I think he's the one. Isn't he the one that's saying "I fought the law"? Pop. Uh, what you mean, the Bobby Fuller re record? Well, before Bobby Fuller did it, it was written. Pro probably, I'm not too sure. What, the Crickets recorded it yeah. um, in 59, I believe. Yeah. Take, check it out, their version of it, you can find. And if you listen to it, it sounds like Buddy Hub is not him, because they did it with... Yeah. I think you might be right about that. I'm sorry, I have to check the facts on it. I think maybe Sonny Kerr one that, that wrote it, too. I mean, yeah, I, I guess I'll have to look that up, too. It's always interesting to find out new stuff. <laughs> they recorded it before Bobby Fuller did. So. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so to ask you about, uh, since uh, we talked about your love for old music, what do you think of current music today, like in the world right now? Like hip-hop um, or, or heavy metal? Or <laughs> well, you know, uh, the, the, funny, the, the, the funny thing about it, I actually like all kinds of music, and okay. I've studied music. I... Uh, studied a lot of jazz and listened to a lot of jazz and, and uh, rock and roll music is something that when I uh, I went to college and studied music but you know at the time I went to school you didn't study rock and roll in college that was not even um, considered a, a course or something that a professor would teach because it wasn't uh, recognized as yeah uh, I guess legitimate, and I was studying when I was studying jazz in school. I guess it was around the time you were born. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> I was, yeah. <laughs> I was, uh, I was uh, having. We were having trouble being able to to learn about jazz music because most of the people in the administration in the school were behind classical music, and they didn't consider they didn't, they were still having a hard time accepting jazz as legitimate music to be taught in college. And so um, we were dealing with that. So even though I was trying to play jazz trumpet, I was had to study classical in order to meet my uh, requirements. But okay. nowadays, I understand in colleges they they have people teaching about rock and roll, and to me, I think that's great. And uh, but at the same time, I always thought the neat part about rock and roll is that you can you learn it on your own and you do your own thing with it yeah, so yeah. there was a lot of freedom to that <laughs> in my mind I enjoyed it I still like that so much and I, although I play guitar I don't I always I'm forever an amateur on the guitar I will always be one I can't you know I, I can't just put it in that framework where okay. you have to you know I don't know so you, uh, so you've never you've never tried to like record an album or anything like that ever uh, we did do an album. We have one that's called The White Sport Coat. Oh. Um, we did it a few years ago. We're hoping to have another one out pretty soon. You can actually find it online. We don't have the page published right now, but you can actually purchase it still. Um, but it's called The White Sport Coat. It has uh, different artists. We called it that because uh, we did that in honor of Marty Robbins because sure. Marty Robbins, of course, was from Glendale and was recorded in Glendale. And it's got some... Uh, a couple of buddy songs on it. It's got some um, other artists as well on there, so um, people can buy it. Yes, they can. Um, we're hoping to come out with another one soon. Uh, 
So put some more music on it. One of these days, I think we'll have another one for you. <laughs> are people able to sample it a little bit, like to hear like a sample of what it sounds like before they buy it, or or do you have to wait uh, till you get it? You can find it. It's right. It's on there. I think if you just look it up and just go to White Sport Coat CD, come back, okay. buddy, you should be able to find it online. Okay. Um, if you don't, let me know because we have a page uh, that can come up and you can purchase it that way. Oh, and, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we we just currently don't have it published. We're kind of working on some new projects. So, oh, okay. Um, but um, but as I said, we get to meet a lot of uh, people um, in association to those artists, and we we find it really rewarding. Uh, am I running out of time or anything? No, no, no. You're fine. We got plenty of time. We were playing. We were playing for a sock up in uh, Hollister, California, um, up north. And we were doing, it was a benefit, it was at an Elks Club. And we were setting up, and uh, a gentleman came up to us while we were setting up and said, uh, my wife is Richie Vellon's sister, would you like to meet her? Oh, wow. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, and we met her, and that was amazing. Uh, it was, uh, her name's Connie Lemos. Yep. And uh, we actually have a photo of her on our website, if you go to the, the page that shows our song list. Yep. She's down at the, she's at the bottom of it. And I I think that was about five years ago that we met her. Oh wow. Um but she's a neat lady and uh, we're glad that we met her and we do a couple of Richie Allen songs as well. We do La Bomba and play Donna and um Yeah that was one, interest, one oh, interesting good. story, there's a a gentleman that lives out here in Arizona and I haven't met him I just talked to him over the phone and I, I'm telling you based on um, our conversation his name's Jared Howe he's from Minnesota so okay. you might like to be interested in this <laughs> he, he, has a, he has a solo act out here he plays uh, at some restaurants and um, someone told me about him that he met Buddy Howie and he had experience with meeting him so I called him to talk to him on the phone, particularly because we were, I, uh, I want to mention the guys that did the documentary real quick too, Josh Fadham and Brian Ryder are the guys that did the Comeback Buddy documentary, and they they actually were uh, really, really uh, great at the way they did it, and because we were making the documentary, I wanted to meet this gentleman named Jared Howe as a possible person to talk to, but we ended up not doing it. But anyway, he played in a band called The Sentiments when he was 16 years old, and they played at the surf ballroom the day that Buddy Howe performed. They played in the afternoon, and I guess they maybe they didn't get paid. I'm not, I don't think they did. But they went down to play there, and he got to meet Buddy Howe backstage that night before the show, and he got to play Buddy Howie's guitar um, oh, um, backstage for about 20 minutes. And um, he told a story about when Buddy was playing that night at the surf ballroom, um, he dropped his pick and it fell down on the floor of the surf ballroom. And Jared was there to pick the pick up and he handed it back to Buddy and he stuck it in the pick guard of his guitar. <laughs> um, and so, um, the next day when the plane crash happened, uh, Jared and his brother went to the site and apparently they, they got some, a couple of pieces from the plane crash and they, years later, Jared went down and presented, uh, it to Buddy's brother and when he did it, they allowed him to play Buddy's guitar again that was I guess in the at the Buddy Holly Center okay sure and when they took the guitar out the pick was in the pick card the way Buddy put it in there so I thought that was an interesting story oh, yeah <laughs> yeah we were talking about uh, before we started this interview uh, that you were pretty uh, impressed by the fact that I was able to do an interview with uh, Buddy Holly's older brother Larry Holly and uh Oh, definitely. I thought that was neat. I thought that was really a great interview. I totally enjoyed listening to that. Yeah, and I was kind of worried that the sound quality wasn't going to be that great because, you know, uh, you know, with Larry, you know, he, he's an older gentleman now, and so he, he talked pretty slow, and, and he has that, that Texas accent, and, you know, so I, I'm, I'm just glad that it uh, turned out good. 
Yeah, oh, definitely. I, I understood it, though. I thought it was great. And so, good good job on yeah, that. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And it's, it's just kind of nice to uh, to be able to talk to people like that. Anybody that wants to talk about music, whether it's old music or, or, or anything of, of the of the past, I mean, I'm always interested. Uh, the, you mentioned uh, Connie uh, uh, Venezuela or, or Limos now. Uh, yeah. That's the only person I have not interviewed yet as far as my whole uh, attempt to uh, interview the people from the, the Buddy Holly, the life of Buddy Holly and Big Bucky Valance. I haven't heard the Richard Valance uh-huh. story yet. <laughs> that's the only one that's yeah. left as far as I go. <laughs> yeah, she's a really nice lady. We were we uh, we really enjoyed meeting her, so if you can do that, that would be great. Yeah, that would that would definitely complete the ensemble anyway, the, to be one of the rare, one of the first people to be able to, to say that I've talked to somebody from Buddy's life, somebody from Big Bopper's life, and somebody from Richie's life. I mean, that, uh, that's pretty impressive, I'd say. I'd say so, definitely. <laughs> so is there anything else that you'd like to promote at all uh, before we let you go? Um, well, no, I, if anyone wants to check out what we do, they can do it at our website. It's just comebackbuddy.com. And uh, um, anyone, if they'd like to send us an email or anything, that would be great. We like to correspond with people. and and uh, Sure. But I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing some more of the interviews and listening to your show some more. Oh, um, yeah. Sure. Keep up the good work with what you're doing. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I don't Like I said, I don't know how, how much you've seen, but there's a lot that I, I've done 57 interviews as of August of 2012. So, uh, And I wow. used to do interviews back when I was on the radio, too. It's a kind of a long time. It's just, uh, it's just something, you know, I, I don't get paid to do this. This is all just volunteer. Uh, I'm doing it because it's just a love of just uh, being able to do stuff at my house rather than doing it in an actual studio or at a radio station. I, I, I use simple software and Skype. And uh, I'm lucky to get people to to chat with because uh, uh, I I would figure it'd be a lot harder because uh, for me to to get uh, some of that I've talked to because I'm not a Howard Stern I'm not uh, I'm not Dave I'm not you know I'm not a familiar name I'm just a a young guy who's in, you know doing this really by myself so <laughs> yeah and I think I think you find that it's like it's kind of like your uh digging for gold and you'll find a lot of it there that's it's there you know but a lot of people just aren't really looking but there's so many people that are this music means so much to them yeah it just does and they're they're around and they are you know they're excited about it it's 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 just uh it's exciting for them so uh just Keep up the good work. I, I, uh, I look forward to hearing some more of the interviews. This oh, time. I appreciate okay. that. All right, well, well, thanks for being a guest, Mike, and uh, uh, I appreciate uh, having you on. Thank you. Thank you, and good luck with the move, too, Sean, okay? All right, you have a good one. Bye. Thank you. Bye. And that was... There we go. <laughs> and that was Mike Randall, if I didn't say his name enough. Uh, Mike Randall, who uh, does a... Buddy Holly, well, it's a tribute band, but it's also, you know, they're doing other, uh, uh, playing other music, too, uh, from the uh, from the 50s and 60s era, which I think is kind of neat, uh, especially uh, to, to keep it alive, because uh, sadly enough, you know, the oldies, or what people would consider oldies today, is kind of fading out, the 50s and the 60s era, uh, because of how, how far you know, away that decade is from now, uh, you know, like the 60s was like 50 years ago, you know? Like what? 2013. So 1963 was 50 years ago. Uh, so it's been like what? Almost over 60 years since rock and roll was started. Yeah, and so it's kind of as each decade goes by or each year goes by, it's kind of slowly uh, uh, introducing us to the some new oldies, which would be like from the 70s, 80s, even 90s, and and yes, one day 2000s, and and then the probably 20 or 30 years from now. The stuff that are, is getting played now, all the new stuff that you hear now, uh, 20 years from now, or even 10 years from now, will be considered oldies and everything, and stuff from the past and everything. So it's just a, it's just a, a vicious circle sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, go check out his website, uh, come back ba- or comebackbuddy.com, uh, and uh, I will put that down uh, on below. And uh, thanks again for tuning in. This is the second half of the... Uh, of summer now and second half of uh, 
Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture series. We're going to go through September uh, till the end of September, and then uh, we'll start the new season of the Frankie's Lawson Show on Monday, September 30th, which will be my birthday, my 30th birthday. So uh, now that I'm in South Dakota and everything, I, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to showing you guys uh, around the area, uh, meeting new people, getting some new friends. Uh, just showing you guys around, introducing you to my other members of my family, and uh, yeah, it should be a it should be a fun ride. So thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you guys next time for another great Frankie Slauson Show interview. Bye bye. <laughs>